with everybody while we, we start this up, but I found this thing called localhost.run. It's kind of like that ngrok. Um, it's pretty sweet. Um, you basically just can port forward, like, it, they, it's just like ngrok, and they'll port forward something, you know, arbitrary, whatever, for you. So you can start up your, um, you know, web servers and stuff, and then it'll give you an HTTPS uh, URL that you can access it at access it at um, like if you're on your laptop and you wanted to share something with someone else so that is kind of a it's a it's a handy thing and it only requires SSH installed um, it's not open source though which I would think the guy was saying he was planning on making it open source All right, let me bring up wow I am 18 minutes okay Come on. Oh, was that the... Oh, it was. It was the fifth, wasn't it? Thank you. Okay. Eight. Um, cool thing. Okay, and then let's see what else is new. I had everything. So we got those Wopal, the Wopal Rabbit models merged. That is sweet. Finally, we got those in. Good job figuring that out, uh, Himanshu. And uh, what else? Since I don't know if we really had much going on since uh, since the other day. Um, oh. Hashim changed the links. That was good. Finally fixed those. Um, there's this. I think we might have already gone over this, but we got the model plugins importing dynamically. Yeah, and then we talked about um, Scikit and how that's a pain in the ass. Um, and then Wolf Rabbit. Sweet. Um, oh, and we got the new file source tutorial merge. That was great. Nice job on that, Sutanshu. Um, Sweet. Okay, so let's just cover all those things. New file source. Merged. Uh, um, and what was the last thing? Uh, oh, yes. Got some important dynamic. All right. Um, I think let's just make sure that everybody knows everybody because I think we've got a lot of people here today. Um, let me see if I can do the. Where's that? Presentation mode. Change layout. Uh, okay. All right. I guess not. Um, but yeah, so let's, I think if we all, I, I don't know if everybody all knows each other or not, but, um, I know that we have Sudarsana on the call and I don't think, I think a few of you haven't met Sudarsana yet. Um, hi everyone. So Sudarsana and Yash Lamba, uh, uh, were um, both the GSOC students last year. Um, did I say your last name right, Yash? Yeah, yeah, you did. Okay, cool. Yeah, so these guys were our GSOC students last year. They did some great stuff. Um, they did some data source work, um, Sudarsana did, and Yash did some model work, um, and, and we got a, a, we got a lot of, a lot of bugs ironed out, um, last year, um, and as you guys know, there's still more bugs, but we, we did some major, major refactors on things. It was a good learning experience. Um, and yeah, so they're helping us out and they're going to be mentors this year, um, for GSOC. Um, and we'll kind of cover that stuff. Uh, well, well, we'll probably cover that stuff in a few weeks. Um, but yeah, so thanks to them. Um, and then everyone else, do you kind of want to just like roll through? Uh, I'll sort of give you guys, I don't know if you guys know 
if I've really introduced myself much before, but um, so, and then we can just roll down the list here, um, starting with Augen. Um, so I'm John, um, I work at Intel, and uh, the I'm on the security team, actually. Um, I'm not on a machine learning focused team. We've got some machine learning people uh, on the team, but we're really focused on security. Um, and so we do things like work on the Linux kernel and uh, try to improve security there. Um, people on my team do like cryptographic reviews of stuff um, and uh, make sure people are implementing their crypto correctly. Um, I, you guys may have seen that other project, CVE bin tool that Terry, my coworker has. Um, that's, we do some like work like that where we create tools and, and make security easier to do for project teams. Um, and then uh, we've also got um, some people who work on this thing called the trusted platform module, which is uh, this, uh, it's, we have a software stack that um, goes along with um, this hardware uh, thing called a TPM, and that basically does all your cryptography for you, like off the main CPU, so it can't get like side channeled and stuff. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's basically I work on I I, I hit all those areas as well. Um, and so that's that's me, and I am also I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, and uh, it's, luckily we have a beautiful day today here, but it's usually kind of rainy. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's me. Agen, you want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Okay, well, um, Agen, I'm from India. I'm a CS undergrad student. So, like, this is my first open source project. Uh, like, I stumbled upon DFO firmware when going through the past DSOC project. Even though I started this as a DSOC thing, like, the community has been really kind. So, I really enjoy doing this stuff. Like, I learned a lot of cool stuff here. Because, uh, most, like, uh, at least the other Indian students can relate. For our ACADs, it's just some basic stuff which is very really premature and like it's kind of set in the rock so we just do some random projects other than that i'm part of some clubs anime club food club and the it club and i mostly am interested now in ml and DL work and framework so i work in cv based projects and i'm also looking into integrating DL with hardware quantizing deep learning network so those are the projects which i work i usually play football but not now because all of a sudden i'm not going to but hopefully things get better soon. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, Agen. Cool, thanks, Agen. Um, Hashim, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, it's me, Hashim. Uh, I'm an undergrad uh, computer science student from Pakistan. Uh, I'm mostly interested in data science and machine learning. Uh, I was applying to Google Summer of Code when I uh, discovered DFFML, and uh, because of my overlapping interest, I started contributing here. And that's all. Cool. Um, let's see who's who else do we have. Um, all right, looks like Hamanshu, you're up next. Hey, hi, it's me, Hamanshu. So I'm an undergrad student for computer science from India. So I just stumbled upon DFML again after when I was searching for GSOC. So and then I started working from January 1st, I guess, the new year. And yeah, so it was a good experience and I have been learning a lot of things. I'm primarily focused on machine learning and a bit of robotics, especially drones. So that's it. That's all I work. And uh, in my free time, I mostly just roam on the road with my skates. But these day, these days, it's locked down. So yeah, all the time in home. Yeah, that's me. Thanks. Nice. <laughs> yep, that's that's all of us right now, all the time at home. <laughs> um, oh, all right. Let's see. All right. There's me, and then uh, Naim. Uh, thank you, John. Hello, everyone. My name is Naeem. Uh, I'm a master's student at computer science. Uh, my background is engineering. Uh, I mostly use machine learning for application in engineering, but I have never been a, a computer, science, computer scientist or a, de or a developer. 
So uh, I was looking for a good uh, open source project. So I found the FFML and I'm so happy that uh, I found a very good group, a very supporting group. Uh, and I hope to learn a lot of things from you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thanks. It's uh, yeah. I gotta say, it's been it's really great to have this group of people that we get together and work on something cool. I think we're you know like we can see the there's some serious progress that's being made here. It's awesome. Um, cool. All right, Saksham. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Saksham. Uh, I am a second year student. Uh, I uh, information technology undergrad. So in first year, I tried my hand on web development, but it was very boring. So I shifted to data science and machine learning and stuff. And, not, and now I'm trying my hand on computer vision and stuff. So I hope I make the best out of this three to four months of school summer of course. Thank you, John. All right. Thanks, Sakshan. Sudhanshu. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, this is Sudhanshu here. So uh, I'm from Mumbai, India, and uh, I'm in third year undergraduate student. Uh, so I've got like one year more to go. And uh, so my primary interests are like probably in data science because I actually started doing some data science course from my first year and stuff. And I actually started contributing to open source from the like previous year Hacktoberfest. So, oh, nice. Yeah. Sudarshana. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sudarshana. I'm from Chennai, Tamil Nadu, uh, India. So uh, I got introduced to GSOC last year while I was a student uh, at uh, NIT Trichy. Uh, now I'm working as a technology associate in Morgan Stanley. Uh, GSOC has been a great journey for me. It was a wonderful experience, and uh, like you guys are doing an amazing job. Uh, all of you are contributing, and it's very. I'm very glad to see like the contributions. I hope to be a part of the journey this year. But then, like uh, I have been on and off the FML cause of workload, but hopefully this time I'll be uh, there for you guys. Like, thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right, and Yash. Hi guys, I'm Yash. I'm a second year undergrad in Delhi, India, and I contributed to DFFML last year uh, for the machine learning models, and uh, it has been a really great experience. And it was actually the starting point where I like entered open source and began working on projects. And John has been such a great and patient mentor throughout Google Summer of Code, and I hope you guys learn a lot from him too. Hey, thanks, Yash. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, yeah, and and that's another thing. I think that um, like just the process of contributing to open source is like it's very interesting, and and it's it's interesting to navigate, and you only sort of get more and more experienced, obviously. And you see, like, there's so many different communities out there, and then there's so many lack of communities around things too. Um, and it's interesting when you go into a project and you're like, I fixed your bugs. Like, hey, like there's bugs and they needed to be fixed. So I fixed them. And then you just like, you, you, you email people and you ping them on GitHub and they don't respond and they don't respond and they don't respond. It's like, just please merge my pull request. Like, and then there's like, there's, there's just a whole range of, of things. And then there's other people like the kernel community is like, uh, very strict and snarky, um, sort of sometimes they can be a little, I don't know if you guys have ever read some of the Linux kernel mailing list stuff, but, um, yeah, there's, they, they can, they can get a bit in a bit heated exchanges with each other. It's, it's kind of interesting, but yeah, there's like very different styles to interacting with all these communities and it's kind of fun to just go around and, and, uh, you know, just like, you know, you, you, you're using, you're using something and you think, Oh, like, I wonder, I wonder if I could make this, you know, add this feature to this this thing, and then you go and you try, and and you see like just even if you don't succeed, like you you get a feel for like what is what is the process like in this community, because um, then it just gets only easier and easier. Like once as you go through things, like you uh, you know you see bugs and stuff, or you like you see you see documentation issues, and you just like get familiar with. Uh, uh, you kind of get, it's like, takes a little bit to get, at least for me, like I, it took a little bit for me to get comfortable with like, oh, like, 
you know, should I go and should I post this change? Um, you know, like they probably know what they're doing uh, more than me. It's their project, but sometimes, you know, it's like, well, I didn't see that. Like, thanks for fixing that. Um, and so you get the whole whole range of responses and like submission process and everything. It's open source is fun. I love that there's just like people all over the world writing software that's free. <laughs> I think it's great. Um, all right. Well, so let's get down to business. I just wanted to sort of do a little, uh, make sure everybody knows each other because like it's been really nice to have this. Uh, I think I, I love this community that we have. Um, and I think you guys are all really great and you work hard and we all work hard and, and we're making cool stuff. And I think it's especially nice now like that we're all sort of remote to, to have this. It's, it's fun to have this community. Um, so thank you for joining me on this wild ride. Um, all right. So uh, we talked about merge stuff, new file source tutorial merge. Let's just like view that for a second because that looks sweet. Oh god, that's zoomed in. Um, and then tutorials source, and then we got simple source for new files, new file types. Sweet. Uh, yeah. So this goes over how to write. Um, so um, Sutanchu went through and wrote a source that does. Uh, any files like dot any files um you like probably know those from like various you know anything in like etsy um uh, slash etc um you know lots of those config files for various daemons are written in, in any format um so basically he goes through and he shows us how to write the a file source um, because this is a common thing that we've run into before with like the idx source and stuff um we're like oh okay like oh well, we got a new data type how do we write a how do we write a source for it and this common thing that comes up so it's nice that we have this tutorial now um and uh so yeah this is great um nice job with that um and then we got of course the wopal rabbit models um and that'll be great um because that's the other thing i wanted to do is we also i think that this right now uses the python api right am i correct in that not the command line it doesn't call out to the command line version uh yeah this is using the python api for mm -hmm. now. but the way that you do it correct me if i'm wrong but the code that you wrote you had to write all the code to convert the format like to put convert the input format of the feature data right yeah yeah okay yeah, yeah I, had to do, I had to do that okay so yeah so basically what what we'll be able to do is take this and then run the command line client because it takes the same format right yeah. Okay, sweet. So yeah, I don't know. If you, so we've talked about async IO and the event loop and stuff before. Oh, and that brings me to another thing. Let me just uh, YouTube. Um, we've talked about async IO and the event loop and, you know, how everything in DFML runs in the async IO event loop. Um, and let's see. And let me grab this. So the thing about the event loop is it's it takes up the whole main thread. Hello everyone, um, how's everyone doing? Let me see. Oh no. Pause. Uh, I want to share this playlist. You pull playlist. Okay. So I put together this playlist, um, and I was thinking I could put a few playlists together on the YouTube channel about how to learn or like, you know, some learning resources for various things that might be helpful when like in conjunction with the FFML or just machine learning in general. So if you guys have links to things, um, let me know and we'll add them to that. So i uh, going to create YouTube playlists um, with learning resources. And then here's one on async IO. Okay, um, so so um, yeah, this is just a little video about. I think it says advanced async IO, but I feel like she does a pretty good job of sort of like giving you bite-sized pieces. Um, and so basically what happens is that since we're running within this event loop, like it's all within one thread, we're not, we don't have any code right now that calls out and creates other processes or threads. Um, so um, when you do a CPU bound task, like it, the, 
the event loop is really good for IO bound tasks. So like anytime we go and grab a network resource or something like a URL or, you know, a web page, um, that, or like it was connection to my SQL database. That's why this is good is because we're usually IO bound on, like uh, in most tasks are IO bound, except for like a few certain things like, you know, computationally intensive things such as machine learning. So that becomes a bit of a problem. Um, because of course we're going to lock up that main thread so if we've got all these right whenever you have you see async def um you have uh that that's a that's a coroutine function so that means that that function might be doing some kind of async io op like asynchronous uh, I, io operation and so like it might be reading from or writing to some kind of network socket and at some point that basically means like at whatever point that is it's going to to uh pause execution there after it finishes the write or read and then it's going to go back into this loop that's essentially a select call a select system call if you if you know what that is or you can you can look up the select system call um and then that uh ends up in this it's basically this uh the kernel will then wake up the process uh and say oh, okay you've got you know these file descriptors or you know these sockets that are ready to be read from or written to um and so then it's like okay it wakes up that user space process again and it says okay what ones are ready to be read from and what ones are ready to be written to and then it goes through all of its list of coroutines uh those async def functions that were running and it says okay if you were one of the guys that was waiting on this socket um now i'm going to run that coroutine now i can't run that coroutine if i'm if i only have one thread and one of those threads you know went and pulled a bunch of data from the database database and then ran a machine learning model like a tensorflow model right now for example it's going to lock up that thread so you're not going to be able to go and grab other sockets and do other io operations while this thing is happening um and so uh what's interesting we'll we have ways we have there's the the nice thing about what we've done is that everything is serializable, so we can take everything and serialize it into a config structure, um, which means that it's very easy to pass that config structure into a new process, and then we can have uh, other, like we can run a model within another process. Uh, that's something we'll have to do eventually. Um, but with something with when you run, for example, uh, when you use the subprocess module, that's obviously calling out and creating a new process, um, and you are returned these stream reader and stream writer objects, which are um, basically they're they're like pipes. You know, if you know what a Unix pipe is, but you can you know read. Uh, data from one side and write data to the other side and that uh, is set up in within the async io framework so that you can yield um, or so that it can pause execution um, and so what we can do is we can spawn that sub process of wopal rabbit and then we can asynchronously stream the data in from you know the database or wherever and then it within the separate process will do the machine learning so that we're not locking up the main thread that we're using and then we stream the data back in um, and so that's sort of like the ideal flow that we'll get to eventually um, so that's uh, that's basically what we need to do is set up some stuff that will basically uh, like for example with the model predict operation what we'll probably want to do eventually is actually have that start a new thread um, or a new process and run the model um, stuff in that in that thread um, and but we'll have to figure out you know the logistics of getting data in and out in a performant way um, so that we don't lock up the main thread but we're still processing the the data we need to process um okay uh that's just i just wanted to go over some of that because async io and understanding how that all works is important um did that make sense uh, yeah yeah it does make sense that'd be cool also because then we'll be able to lot of a lot of other things because still they're developing this python api and there are a few things we can't do in Python yeah. API that they support from CLA. Sweet. So that would be good. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Uh, need to uh, add support for calling out with subprocess to the CLI version of Okay. Um so uh let's 
Um, let's go through, uh, I know, so, so Augen, what's the status on that pull request? I mean, so I'm reviewing it, but it looks like uh, there's probably... Yeah, it's completed, but uh, the CI, I, I saw your suggestion, I will push those changes tonight. But okay. the CI is failing for some test. Okay. Uh, but I, uh, all of them are passing locally. I don't know what's happening there. Okay, okay. Um, like the TensorFlow Hub and I think Transformers, they are failing, but all of them are passing uh, when I run them locally. The TensorFlow Hub and Transformers are failing. Okay, well, this should have no effect on that, so that's yeah. probably fine. Um, so let's see. And then. And I did go through the tutorial from start to end. And okay. It's Good job. Thank you for doing that. Um, the only thing was, I was wondering, let's see, uh, where is that? I want to see the actual file, FFmpeg operations. All right, great. Um, input file I'm resolution. Huh? Uh, there are some log statements still left there. I'll remove this. Okay. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some more. I'm gonna give you a little, a few more comments on this, um, yeah. and then we'll we'll take it from there. Um, but this looks great. I'm very excited about this. I was just I was just uh, I was just going on to, uh, and then we'll all we'll all run through this um, so that everybody can see once we merge it, because um, this is very cool. Basically, what we're doing yeah, here is. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, what Agen has done here. Then, like, if you want to like add something else, or if there's some parts that are not clear, we can improve mm -hmm. the documentation also. Like yeah, exactly, that and that'll be good to get everybody's feedback on that. Um, yeah. But basically, what Agen's done here is, you know, so we have these data flows, um, and you know, a data flow might include the using a machine learning model for prediction or something, but this is a basic example of something that we've had to do all the time with the documentation, which is take a little video recording and turn it into a, uh, a GIF so that we can put it on the documentation website. Um, and so this is basically showing, okay, how would I take that, make it an operation, and then whenever I change the code in this Git repo, right? So say I say I make a Git repo and I throw this Python file in it that has, um, you know, a little wrapper around um, FMF, running FFmpeg, right? And that's what this, uh, that's what, where did it go? that's what this is right here it's like you know it's just this little wrapper function that says these this i'm going to run ffmpeg and i'm going to run it with these arguments right um and so um so we write this file and then well we want you know we want to make this accessible and so what we're doing is we're standing up somewhere uh, we, we make a Git repo for it, we commit it and we push it to the Git repo. And then on maybe like a server that we have, we go and we deploy this, uh, we, we deploy a, um, an HTTP, we use the HTTP API to have another flow, data flow that responds to a webhook. Um, and a webhook is basically this giant blob of data that GitHub will send uh, an arbitrary URL. You can put it in the settings of your repository. And uh, then whenever any, you can specify which events, like if it gets a push event to the repo, to the master branch, it can send this webhook over and the webhook will say, hey, something happened and then notify this service. So basically now we have this data, this other data flow, which sits in uh, behind an HTTP API and it, uh, whenever you push to your GitHub repo, GitHub sends this webhook to this webhook service, which we're running like in another terminal, and uh, and the webhook service will say, oh, like let me pull down the latest version of that repository, rebuild the container that it's running in, and redeploy the container. So what you end up with is basically you make changes to these operations and these files, you push them up to GitHub, and now they're automatically redeployed at some URL. Um, and so that's very sweet. And so basically, you know, like this, you know, it could be FMPEG, it could be some, you know, a specific machine learning flow, um, which is, which would be cool, right? Um, so that's what's going on there. Um, and we need to also, I just want to sort of say this for my own thinking and, oh, oh uh, we need to loop back on this guy because um, I think that we may have, uh, I think I may have fixed this um, unintentionally a while ago. Um, 
this was a big one um, and it probably needs to be cleaned up so um, we'll have to go look at this at some point um, I'll look at it after we get done with this okay yeah yeah once we get done with this if you want to just see where we were at and maybe try to merge thing yeah. like merge master or something because it looks like github is very confused about everything that's happening here um, sweet. Like a lot of the third page after that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, FFmpeg demo almost done. We'll, we'll review in weekly sync when complete. Um, and then need to circle back on uh, uh, integration usage example changes from December okay and then this data flow based preprocessing source so let's see I haven't had a chance to look at this one yet um, so where are we at here did you you got the test case yeah also so, uh, just a minute yeah uh, when the thing that name posted today I was going over that tutorial once more uh, but like oh, yeah. last time when I tried that, like I was able to get the database out. Oh, you... When I ran it again, I got some errors. Mm -hmm. So, like, if someone else also can... Uh, yeah, see, so, so that tutorial... So, well, that tutorial is probably just not working then, so we probably need to make a, an issue to validate that tutorial. Um, is that what you're saying? You had an issue running Docker? Or what? What did? What uh, was the I issue with? No command, but uh, the the HTTP server no. When it ran, it uh, throw back an error that the SQL syntax is not correct. And oh, weird. Hmm. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's like I it used I used to be able to run that fine. Okay, let's make an let's make an issue for usage integration um, not working. Multiple reports of the this usage are not working. Let's run through. There's definitely something wrong with that data flow file because when I regenerated it, uh, like from the beginning, by that cat and like it worked, but the when if I use the DF file, which is the right now, it doesn't work. So okay. So yeah, I think if I remember correctly, what happened here was the, um, if I remember correctly, the issue with this was, let me pull up, oh, this. I believe the issue is with, um, where is it, group by spec. Um, I think because this this at one point we had a spec for this thing but we actually didn't have the spec validation it was just for the purposes of so uh, 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 da -da. operations yeah so yeah this doesn't have a spec anymore but let's see spec spec we have git repo spec. Um, yeah, okay. So when you assign, it used to be that when you assign something to spec, it would show up like this um, so that you could see what the parameters of this dict are. Um, and that's basically the, what the spec is. And now we're actually enforcing the conversion. And the thing is that now that we're enforcing the conversion, that spec is wrong. We shouldn't have the spec in there. And so we removed the spec from the code. We just didn't regenerate the YAML and remove it from there. Um, so that's what's happening there. So this is why we need to have the, we need to do some work to automate the testing of the tutorials. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what that will all entail, um, but that needs to happen at some point because uh, you know it's it's a lot of work to revalidate the tutorials, and we really need to make sure that they get validated on on every run of the CI. Um, but let's see. Okay, so. Uh, issues with integration usage example. Okay, and then Saksham. Um, so you got the test case here. How is this going? Uh, can you check if the I've written what I've uh, tested is correct? 
Results, test value, test result, test value, test result. Like, do we need the I result do. in like a single dictionary or uh, because I'm uh, running the data flow twice here? You're running the data flow twice here. Um, what do you mean? You mean you're getting two output results or yes oh oh, oh i see yeah you actually run the data flow twice i see yeah so what are you asking about this then so is this the correct way uh, have you checked the operation associate definition operation i've written um test value is feed and that should be the definition that's feed yes um and then so the definition is feed and then yeah that looks correct this looks correct to me yeah and then output is yes these guys and they are output um, mm, definition dead beef or dead def yes this looks good this looks great perfect i think this will work um well it does work if the test pass it works perfect um so then the so last I, yeah sorry continue i wrote you like uh i wanted some help with how the these two operations will work together i'm not very clear mm -hmm. so what we're going to do here is basically um we need to add so let's see um so what we need to do is have where'd that go here it is all right so in here we're gonna do um we're going to make a bunch of these right um and we're going to have them be Okay. Or well, actually, can't say. actually, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. Don't have a clear understanding of how two operations work together. How the operations work together? Oh uh, yes. Okay. So, okay. Actually, this is good, and then this just needs to be changed to. Um, uh, let's see. What is the output of this edit feature? So edit feature dot output. So. Edit feature dot op dot outputs output dot name. Okay. So what this says is basically we're saying uh, just like you did in the in the test case above, we're gonna take each feature name and map it to whatever um, the output of this function was, this operation. Right? So if the years feature went into this operation and it was a value of two, then it would get multiplied by 10. And so it would be 20. So we would end up with years colon 20 in the output here. Um, and let's see. Um, and then let's see, let's see. Uh, Oh, actually, I think we may run into an issue. So we may run into an issue with um, the fact that the output operation is going to be generating multiple outputs with the same output operation. Um, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there, I guess. Um, so how do the operations work? Well, that's sort of one of the problem right now is that we needed to add that syntax. Um, so, okay. So right here you have data flow auto associate definition and edit feature. And so what data flow auto does is it basically creates a data flow by looking at all the data types of, um, 
of the operations that you give it. And so it'll match inputs to outputs. So if you have anything that has the same input definition and anything that has the same output definition, it'll tell the one operation that has an input matching the output of the other one that it needs to be connected, right? Um, and so, um, so with this in particular, the output operations sort of like they don't they they are getting like their input is this spec object right so that's why we say you know dot opt at input spec um, because we're going to create this new input that's going to be used into the associate definition output operation um, so basically you you throw the inputs into the network and then whatever operations are applicable for them those inputs end up going to as their the arguments to those functions that, that are those operations um, so if we put in this the you know if we put in four inputs to this network and they are all you know in the format and for um, the associate definition then the associate definition operation is going to get called four times um, each with those different um, inputs and so um, so the um let's see um then actually uh, i wanted to ask like how will we pass the uh, output of one operation to the input of another operation so that has to do with the let's see um, uh, da -da. So this has to do with this flow dictionary here. And so what we do is we, I want to do, we have a YAML file now. So basically the way that the flow works is you, for each operation, you go through its inputs and you say, where is that input allowed to come from? Um, and that's how you define uh, the connections between them is you go through each operation that you want in your network and you say where, okay, what are the inputs for this operation and where is each input allowed to come from? Um, and so in this example, we've got this, um, so we've got, um, let's see, we've got the accept user input operation. Um, and then we've got, we're going to do a literal eval on it. We're going to create a dictionary and then we're going to feed that dictionary through model predict. And then we're going to print the output. So the first thing that's going to happen is input, uh, this, uh, accept user input is going to get called because it doesn't have any arguments. So it gets run automatically. And so then the output is this input data. Um, uh, so if you look at get user input, in the outputs dictionary, there's this input data um, uh, uh, defin or def definition. And so what we're saying here is for the literal eval input, the inputs to this function are, there's only one and it's called stir to eval. And you're allowed to get it from, this is an array of places that you're allowed to get it from. And the index, the only index in this array is a mapping of get user input to input data saying that this operation, we're going to get it from this output in this operation. Um, and then we go through and we do that for everything else. So like when we're creating this, uh, we're then gonna take that and make it the key in, or, or we're gonna make it the value in a dictionary. So we use this create mapping, uh, create feature map operation, or which is the same as it's dffml.mapping.create. Um, and we say, okay, well, what, what are the inputs? Right. Well, the key is allowed to come from the seed, so seed dot years, and so we say seed dot years here, and then well, the value is going to come from the output of um, this operation, this literal eval input, and the output name is stir after eval. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Now, now it seems so clearly clear about. Okay. I'm little clear. Was that what you were asking about, pretty much, or? Uh, yes, I was. Uh, con I was just confused about how I will pass the input output of, from one operation to the input of another operation. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, and the other thing is besides, so. Go for it. Uh, besides that, I just wanted to uh, ask you to take a look at the pull request. Or if I'm go, if if there is anything wrong with it, mm -hmm. if no. I have missed something or anything. It looks good. It, you look like you're on the right track so far here. Um, you're gonna want to do. 
Um, so do you want to tackle this um, this uh, 607? I can take a stab at it. All right. Yeah, let me know how it goes. Um, and if you get really stuck, then, you know, uh, just just give me uh, give me a ping and I'll come take a look at it. Um, I've got I've got a very full plate right now or other, otherwise I would go take a look at it, but it would be good for you to, you know, understand that code. Um, so, all right, great. Is that all um, that we need to talk about, Sakshom? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, cool. So how's everybody else doing? I just wanted to go through the pull request that we have up first. I know we're almost the end of the time. Uh, here, uh, hi, John. Uh, hey, uh, I am. My question is uh, very related to the uh, data flow that you mentioned right now, and mm -hmm. I uh, I could understand what's going on on there. Uh, so in one of the examples that I couldn't run yesterday, it, it is the, the automating mm -hmm. example that you... Yeah, the automating classification example. If you scroll down, please, uh, here is a shell script command for running. Yeah, if we go down. Oh, no, uh, this looks like it's off, or is it? Yeah. Okay, let's see. Yeah, this uh, this one. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, in, in the, I also uh, took a look at the should I example, so it was easy to understand. But in this one, you are uh, putting these, uh, I guess, in a uh, temporary file. It functions in a temporary files. So I don't understand how that program understand what are these because we are putting in the file. Oh, so the substitution. So basically, yeah, I don't know. This probably isn't the most clear way to do this. We should. I should probably. We should probably change this, because uh, basically the reason we're putting them in this file is just to sort of like have a nice clean list of them. But we should probably just mm -hmm. separate it with backslashes and do it all here, because um, what this does is this does a substitution. So if you say cat temp operations and you put it within the um, like the dollar sign um, and then parens, it's going to, right. it's going to cat this file. It's going to take the output of this command of running this thing and use it as arguments for this command. Um, so that's what's happening there. Uh, right, right. Yeah, I, I, under, I understand oh, that okay. part, but I don't, but I don't understand how uh, the FFML data flow create config. Uh, understand, for example, let's say, uh, we have a git repo default branch. Mm -hmm. From where? Uh, the where does it grab that? And the inputs, outputs, their, its relationship. Ah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, and this is this probably should not be the first example here, because um, I think that yeah, okay. I think we need to do some reorganization, but we sort of know that. Um, okay, so. The way that this works is it all has to do, yeah, we need, really need to clean up sort of the flow of these tutorials. Um, it all works by the entry points system. Um, mm -hmm. Now, where the hell is it? Well, okay, it's way the hell down here. Okay, so you register the operations and this is the same way it works for models and, and for everything because everything's a plugin and this is basically how the plugin system works um so we put we under this entry point section of the the setup.py we put under dffml.operation we just list out all the operations that we want to provide um Okay. that this package provides and we provide you know we basically say this thing will map to and then you give the python path and then with colon for the thing in the file so you do the you know should i dot pypy and then colon the function name within dot the py, pypy dot py file um and so that's how it knows when you when you're that's how it knows when you say you know get clone repo uh what it's doing is it's looking at um it's looking at this list here. So clone get repo, mm -hmm. and then it goes, it basically, it loads this object in, in um, uh, so dffml feature git slash feature slash operations.py. And then, 
and then it so it loads this object here and then it reads you know it then it has access to the inputs and outputs and stuff okay okay yeah any other sort of questions in that area i know that's kind of confusing stuff uh no thank you that's that's uh, very helpful okay so All right. Anybody else uh, got anything they wanted to talk about today? Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Hey, how's it going? Is that Hashim? Yeah. All right. Uh, so I was a little confused about uh, issue number 619. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, I am aware of the recent changes to the doc testing and everything. Oh, yeah. But... Uh, oh, yeah. I'm not sure how this comes together uh, in the issue. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. we're moving the file and uh, we want another file under the test to import uh, mm -hmm. the test code and everything. So I don't know how it comes together. Basically, we've got this test, test, test data flow or test doc strings. Um, and there's some code in here that goes through and, and it basically reads all the Python files within DFFML. Um, so what we want to do, and then it makes test cases out of them. So we probably want to pull out the similar, the code that's going to be, you know, not specific to DFFML. So any, like all of this wrap stuff is specific. Um, so we probably want to pull it out like MK test case. Um, yeah, the MK test case. And then this here should probably be some kind of function. Because um, this this stuff that's happening here, basically from the end of this file, um, back up. Am I recording? Okay, good. Um, from the end of this file back up uh, to about here, these two for loops, um, they could be put in a function, and then we could just sort of call the function and say, you know, populate my uh, namespace with. Uh, let's see, actually, where. Okay, what do they do? Yeah, they do set atro sys modules name. So this, um, so sys modules name is um, is basically like you know whatever this file is. Um, um, so in this case, it is test dot test doc strings, um, and so if we move it we'll need to provide the module that the test should be added to as an argument. So imagine it's like you have some function like MK test cases, and then it takes the um, module um, and the root and skip um, and you'll see what root and skip are um, and then basically and it probably the package name too um, and then it'll run you know these two blocks here um, and it'll create all the test cases and then it will add them all to um, module um, so this will be like in um, the dffml.util.testing.docstrings. Um, and this will be, we might want to actually name this doc test. Um, and this will be the function call. So uh, call example of being used in model slash tensorflow slash or tensorflow hub slash test slash test docs or doc test dot py um, um, and then so yeah the the call to this would then look something like um, and then you'd have to do root equals pathlib dot path file dot parent dot parent um, so this would be 
if file is test doc test dot parent is test and dot parent is tensorflow hub slash um, and then I believe it is dfml model tensorflow hub right so you're basically going to say look in there um, you won't have a skip I don't think um, because skip is really only useful for scale I feel like if I remember correctly and then you'll say you know tensorflow hub is the package name um, and so if we do now this is our function call um, or like basically our, our test our uh, our file here is um, this is pretty much almost the entire contents of this you know test doc test there's going to be the um, import or from dffml import um, mk doc tests or mk yeah mk doc tests is probably better and then uh, you'll just you know run this you run this just this is basically the whole file here and it will populate it then populates the um, the the global namespace of this file uh, this test doc test file basically what we're doing is we pass this as the module and then this becomes module um, and then so it goes through it creates test cases by reading all the files in this directory that we pass as root and then it um, adds the test cases to the global namespace of, of this file so that when unit tests comes through it sees those test cases and it runs them um, and so basically what we need to do if we refactor this out then um, then yeah we can add basically a file just like this to each um, to each uh, plugin that we have and the plugins will now get the benefit of having their doc tests run too because um, right now like you've seen we have kind of a clunky uh, the we have to do the clunky way of, of creating the sh files and the py files and then running we, we have like a separate test harness that we're basically copy pasting around um, if you look at that example code um, there's like this blob of, of, of unit test code that goes into the um, uh, examples directory the test directory or something I can't remember and that is like we're basically copying that around and so it would be uh, better if we just set up the doc tests uh, infrastructure for that um, but then this is it's like we could so basically we could do this like don't I wouldn't concern yourself too much with it like this so you could do this but like so you could do this but it's still gonna be sort of an exercise and like we need to figure out what is the best way to do this because right now we have um, the the way that we do this is we end up creating these sh files and like some of them say like how do you get the data in um, and so you end up having to do uh, where is the um, uh, Python test okay I guess the Python test here It doesn't oh okay there we go yeah it does it does directory with CSV files so that's I guess that's a problem with this maybe that would end up in the wrap um, and then we'd have two different places the thing is so this is like this is basically the, the problem that we're faced with right now is the same sort of problem with the tutorials is that there's not a good way like there's a good way to test Python code right that is in examples is with the doc test stuff that we have um, the built-in doc test stuff and then the wrappers around it um, but there's not a good way to test the conjunction with the command line commands um, so you know like okay we'll run this you know run this command on the command line to cat the data set dot csv um, to create that file and then run this other command and then you know then we run the python test right and so we don't really have a good way of doing that right now um, so that's kind of where the problem is at and it's like we need we probably need a way we probably just need a way to like read the the problem the problem here is that that there's like different amounts of work involved in all of this right and like the correct solution is to make some plugin for sphinx that goes through and 
reads the documentation blocks, like the code block, sorry, the code block things, and it says, okay, if it's console, run the console command, like probably in a container or something, right? And we just go through and we run everything and we check that the output's correct, right? But that's like involves writing this whole Sphinx plugin probably. Um, so that's kind of a mess. So where we're at right now is we've got this like combination of, of you know, these, these test cases, which will run the bash scripts and stuff. Um, but no, um, like, and then we have the other stuff to test the doc strings. And so this is kind of like a step in between that where we'll be able to test the doc strings, but we won't test the, uh, we won't, we won't, we'd still have to do some of this harnessing setup with the wrap underscore whatever because um, because of the fact that we need to create these files that we're sort of assuming are created with the shell scripts. Um, but for things like, so, so in this particular, what I'm trying to say is in this particular case, the amount of end code that you're going to end up adding to get the example working is basically like net the same because you still have to write the wrapper code to say, you, you still have to do this thing where you say directory with CSV files. Um, you're just going to do it in a different file than this file now. Um, and so like to some extent that's not cleaner, um, but to some extent, eh, yeah, to some extent it may just not be cleaner. It may not be worth it for this, but the issue itself is going to be more the so 619 is probably worth it more for things like the operations than this specific the issue that we were talking about with tensorflow hub um so because if you have like for example the give feature operations and we had example usages in there with them then it would be very helpful to have the doc test stuff for that right um that's that's one place where if we had this abstracted doc test library within util testing then now we just you know pop those three lines uh those three lines here into uh you know test slash test doc test under uh feature git or something and all of a sudden all of the git features are getting their 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 um examples tested right and so that's sorry that was sort of a long it was a very long-winded example but what i was trying to say is that that 619 like has value long term in other places. This isn't actually particularly one of them. Like we, you're going to do it, and you could do it either way. Um, so you may just want to stick with the existing way that we were doing things, um, because that might be cleaner implementation for this for this case. Since you've already got, you can copy that scaffold of like create the sh files or create the create use the sh files to create the csv files and then run the test and you can put it all in one file so that might be the way to go there um but long term that other issue is it's sort of related but but maybe not good for the one that it came from right so did that make sense i'm sorry that was really long-winded yeah that makes sense uh 619 uh would be good to have for later on so yeah. uh i can still do that cool cool yeah i think that'll be good um yeah that'll be sweet yeah we're, we've got some really nice doc test stuff going so thanks for yeah thanks thank you for contributing so many of those doc tests this has been uh that's really that's really beefing it up and the i go on i go on the documentation website every so often and i'm just like you know well okay pretty much every day multiple times a day and i just go look around and i'm like okay does it look right does it look right <laughs> try to notice things that don't look right and it's looking better and better especially with the more um documentation that we have and actually i went through oh this is another thing that i went through and did the other day um you may notice that um because i noticed where we, you wrote all those doc tests but um i don't know if all of them had been um in we didn't have every single page as in like we didn't have every single file under the API docs. And so I went through and scripted the API doc generation. And so now everything shows up. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's, 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 it's good that we have everything now. So you can actually see all the stuff that's being doc tested and that you've written doc tests for. So, yeah, I noticed that where I need. Yeah. So where's, where's, uh, where's sources, where's base source 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 yeah it doesn't look the prettiest <laughs> um but 
it all is there at least there's some there's some beautification that could be done but but at least we have all the examples now we're sure that we're getting them all in the documentation site so sweet all right um anything else no that's it thank you cool thank you does anybody remember what i was going to write here <laughs> so. Uh, so docs issues with usage integration example could be more, um, I have no idea. Does anybody else have anything they want to talk about today? Uh, so, uh, so one more thing. Yeah. Is the testing YAML file auto generator or do we have to add to it? Is the what? The testing YAML file in GitHub workflow. Oh, is, in the GitHub workflow yeah, what about it? Is that auto generator or no? Do we it's have to not. Add it yeah, it's manually. Okay. Yeah, I had to manually make okay. that. Because, yeah, I didn't see it, like the new test showing up. Okay. Oh yeah. So, so I yeah. have added in there. That would actually be a good thing to do. Um, is to add a check for this. Oops. But yeah, this this file is. I like what they've done with this format, but I also feel like it ends up sort of as a mess. Um, but this is these are my per personal. I mean, if you guys, if you guys, you guys have probably noticed, but everything, everything with me is like it has to look, it has to look clean. Um, yeah, I'm very obsessed with every everything needs to look clean um, because you know clean implementations, clean like it's all got to be, it's all it's all got to be right. Yeah, I'm a neat freak when it comes to the code with my with my desk. Um, uh, yeah, not so much. My desk is a mess. But, you know, what's in the desk is, is neat. So, all right. Um, well, uh, is if there's anything else, so I don't know what state, if is anybody looking for something to work on or, um, like, is anybody... Yeah, so, yeah, so I'm Sudhanshu here, so I was hey, looking Sudhanshu. for something to work on. Okay, yeah. so let's see. Um let's see so oh this would be nice this is a good one here um and so unfortunately i didn't i didn't comment too much but basically i'm hoping hoping i'll, I'll explain here um so we did remember you know, we did this thing where where we created a uh uh yeah, so we did this thing where we created a definition for the different arguments and we added the primitive types, right, um, that we support creating. Well, so one of the things that, um, one of the things that, um, that uh, we want to do here is basically, I just realized actually how completely nonsensical this, this list of issues is. This definitely requires more explanation, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so we have this subspec. Let me let me just go. So we did this thing where we're auto creating the definitions, but only for primitive data types, right? So we also have this thing called a subspec, and now might be a good time to see if this is more clearly formatted in the API reference. Um, DF base objects. Um, Um, oh, it's in types. Okay, so yeah. So, uh, yeah, this needs more documentation too. Um, oh, this is, what, that's completely unhelpful. Okay. Um, so, why isn't it picking these up? Uh, whatever. Okay. So, basically, within a definition, um, we've got the primitive, right? And so, what, what we'll have here is we will have the primitive so currently we have that list of primitive types that we support right but for this one what we're going to do is we say if we see an object that's a spec so and a spec is any kind of name tuple or data class so if we see something in the arguments here that it's not in the primitive types but it is a name tuple or a data class then we can take that and we can um and we can, we'll, we're going to create a new definition where we assign that annotation, like that data type, as the spec. And then, um, 
uh, let's just do spec first. Um, okay, so we're gonna we look at it, we see that it's a that it's a name tuple or a data class, and then we say, okay, create a new definition. The primitive is going to be mapping um, because we're mapping it's key value pair mappings, right? Um, or I think it might be map. Um, all of this stuff needs to be validated and standardized at some point. Um, so we need to go through and we'll, we'll assign this to the spec object of the new definition we create. We'll make the primitive map and then we'll say, um, uh, actually, I think that's it. Yeah, that's all we're going to do. Basically, if you, if you see that, um, then create the definition appropriately and just assign the annotation as the spec. Um, now the, the next thing is the issues original title is basically is do it for sub spec. Um, but this makes sense to do first because if we haven't done spec, why would we do sub spec? But so sub spec is basically the same thing. Only a sub spec is, and that's sort of what this is trying to show is this code here is not tested. And if we implement this stuff, then it'll get tested. Um, or we'll, we'll need to implement test too, and it'll get tested. But um, the subspec is the same thing as the spec, but it's basically like, okay, I have a list of objects that are going to be of this type, right? So if I say that this definition, uh, I set subspec, if I set spec um, to some object, and then I set subspec, um, let me just, actually, let me pop open a terminal and do this. Um, Um, definition um, and input. Okay, so so uh, from typing import named tuple. All right, so class uh, my data is named tuple, and oops. of type name tuple and it's got um, you know field name uh, string and age int um, and so now what we want to do is we want to say okay well we've got this definition um, uh, called my data def and it is a definition and the name is my data def and or and the um, spec is, so this is like what you would be programmatically doing if you saw my data in the argument of, or let's just say, so like this is what the operation would look like. So uh, def um, process my data, um, and it's going to say data, my data, right? So this is, you're going to see it in the annotation when you have it here. Um, um, and so then you'll create my data def. So this is what you'll do programmatically is you'll say, okay, well, we need this new definition to add to assign to the uh, inputs dictionary. Um, to, so you're going to map my data to this new thing, uh, right? So uh, kw args and then kw args um, uh, inputs. Inputs data equals definition name equals my data. Um, so. Dot my data and then primitive map and then spec equals my data. So, okay, so, so now we've got this definition here. And so if we create a new input, so we say a, so input um, value is um, name and we pass it a dictionary. So Bob and then uh, age of 42 um, and say definition 
equals my data or equals this guy then you see that it got automatically converted to this spec um, and so if we said um, subspec equals true um, let's see yeah if we said subspec equals true and we passed in a list of these guys then each element in the list gets converted and if we passed in a dictionary um, then each uh, value in the dictionary gets converted um, so that's does that give you an idea of what's going on here Cool, cool. Sure, sure. And then, so yeah, basically we're going to automatically create those definitions. And uh, then the, actually, let's let's add this to uh, the definition <laughs> doc string here. Um, so the other thing is that, um, so this lends itself also similarly to, um, I think there's an open issue to also create the result automatically. So if you see while you're in here like this is probably another pull request um yeah this guy um so let me put this in here um and then where was the other one uh, where did that go where did that go Oh, here. All right, yeah, so this guy and this guy would probably be good next targets for you, and the, and the other one is to create if you see the result. Um, so, you know, if you've got a, uh, if you've got a function here, um, where'd you go? Um, yeah, so if you've got this function and you see that it's got a return type annotation, um, then you uh, you can make just basically say okay if I see an annotation on the function and there's only like one value it's not like a tuple or something um, then um, well I guess as long as the value the return type is not a dict um, you can go through you can just say result um, so and actually you could even do it you could even do it where if you see a if you see something that's a name tuple or a data class, then you extrapolate the the typing information from that. Um, you could even do that too if you wanted to get fancy, which actually would be really great. Um, so basically, sort of like what we did here, but the reverse, right? If you see um, one of these, uh, like if you see a name tuple like my data in the annotation, um, then go through and instead of like with this one it's just we just have one type so okay we're just going to say result process my data you know output and then the only output is going to be result and then you just make a new uh, definition for it like we were doing um, but if you see a named tuple here you could go and for every key in the, in the value in the keys of named tuple like name and age you can go create a definition with the appropriate uh, primitive there um, and you could even, you know, recurse into that and say, okay, if I see it, if I see one of these, uh, you'd only recurse one level down, or you'd only go one level down, though, and you'd say, okay, if this, you know, if I have my data as my output here, and I see name, and name is actually a name tuple, okay, then I'm going to go th through, and I'm going to create a definition where this is actually a subspec, um, or you would not, uh, not a subspec. You're going to go through and say this is the spec for the name definition is whatever the name tuple would be that is in place of string in this situation. Um, okay, cool. I actually have to run. Um, so did anybody else have anything quick that they wanted to talk about? or So if not, all right, well, I'll talk to you guys all on Gitter, and then just ping me if you've got any any updates. Or uh, I guess something that's been helpful recently is, is if you push changes to a pull request, um, and you ask for a review, just like tell me if you're you tell just give me a little synopsis of like what's changed or, or what where everything is at because um, I've 
just been super swamped lately and that really helps me review your pull request faster so cool all right thanks everyone i'll post this video because i remember to record it this time and uh, i'll talk to you guys on uh, tuesday have a great weekend yeah thank you Brett, thank, thank you, you. thanks bye, -bye. You're